Hi everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Camille Meir and I'm on the events team at the bookstore and I'm thrilled to be welcoming Susan Elia McNeil to present her newest novel in the Maggie Hope mystery series, The Hollywood Spy, in conversation with fellow author Pam Jenoff. Um, virtual programs like the one you're about to see carried us through the heart of the pandemic and they continue to be bright spots in our days as we slowly, gradually attempt to recover. So I want to give a huge thanks to Susan and Pam for joining us this evening. Um, so just a couple quick housekeeping notes. You should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they can't hear or see you. So if you do have a question, which we highly encourage, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your question. Um, you can submit questions anytime at, dur during the event and at near the end of the program, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, there's also a chat, um, which you can't, um, type into, but I will be posting the link to buy tonight's book as well as Pam's latest book. Um, so be on the lookout for that link and make sure you purchase a copy. Um, a caveat for tonight's event, uh, especially because the weather is pretty bad um, in the Northeast right now, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to solve them as quickly as possible. Um, and we'll be continuing our virtual series across the summer. Um, so make sure to head over to our website and uh, best bet to stay up to date with all of those is to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, one upcoming event that I would love to point out is uh, this coming Thursday. So in a couple of days on July 8th at 8 p.m., we're really excited to have Michael Pollan presenting his newest book, This Is Your Mind on Plants in conversation with Alex Spiegel. Uh, tickets for that event are live now to purchase, so please go ahead and check it out on our website. Um, so a little bit of background on our authors and then we will get started. Susan Elia McNeil is the New York Times bestselling author of the Maggie Hope Mysteries. Um, Susan won the Barry Award and has been nominated for the Edgar, the McCavity, Agatha, Left Coast Crime, Dillis, and ITW Thriller Awards. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband and son, and The Hollywood Spy is her 10th novel. Um, and Pam Jenoff is the author of several books of historical fiction, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Lost Girls of Paris and The Orphan's Tale. She lives with her husband and three children near Philadelphia where she teaches law. Her latest novel is The Woman with the Blue Star on sale now. Um, Susan and Pam, thank you so much. The virtual stage is now yours. Thank you so much for having me. And hi, Pam. Hello, thank you, Camille, for the warm welcome. And thank you, Susan, my goodness. So I'm gonna pause and have a fangirl moment here because, uh, you know, I was such a fan of the Maggie Hope series long before we met. Um, and I'm gonna say I met. I was a fan of the Commandant's Girl long before we met, so. So this is like a beautiful meeting of beautiful friendship. So thank you for inviting me and happy launch day to you. Thank you so much. And happy recent launch day to you, I have. You. I know we have each other's books, so we're okay. doing like a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense like we're both women about the same age we're we're married we have kids and we're both novelists writing about world war ii we, we have a lot in common we do and after this pa pandemic we are getting together we're gonna yes. figure this out Absolutely. but less people did not come here to listen to me fangirl or to us chit chat they came here to hear about your new books so um why don't you kick us off and give us sort of the elevator pitch for the Hollywood spy since it just came out today we're going to assume that no one has read it yet not because no one has read it but because we don't want spoilers so go ahead tell us about the Hollywood spy okay so the elevator pitch is Maggie leaves London goes to Hollywood to ostensibly solve a murder, but there's so much else going on in the US at that time. And she thinks she's going to be going to a land where everyone is standing shoulder to shoulder to fight the Nazis. And that that is true, but it's not quite the whole truth. So she finds out she's researching the, the murderer, but also like what's going on with different Nazi and different spies. Okay, excellent. So this is your 10th book in the Maggie Hope series, correct? It is. It is. Right. I can't believe right. it. So I want to hear, because I've read all the Maggie Hope books, so I want to hear the origin story. I want you to tell me how Maggie came to be. Take, take us back. Well, Maggie came to be, it's such a strange um, story, but 
Um, I was in London because my husband, uh, who is a puppeteer and works for the Muppets and the Jim Henson Company and Sesame Street, he was doing a character called Bear in the Big Blue House. And Bear in the Big Blue House was huge in the UK. And so we went over one summer for Disney Channel UK. I was actually, I had just lost my job. So I was like unemployed and super sad. And this friend of ours said, uh, you know, you might want to visit the Churchill War Rooms because, and he went through this whole thing with his beautiful accent, but basically it's despite what you Yanks might think, World War II didn't start with Pearl Harbor. And I, I took it to heart. And the very next day I went to the Churchill War Rooms. And I have to say I was writing before that, but it was a lot of sort of career girl, sex in the city kind of stuff you know I was a single girl in New York for most of that so I was that that was my thing but no I went to the war rooms and it was this this huge catalyst for writing about World War II and seeing where the secretaries worked like writing about the secretaries and the, the private secretaries and everything it was such a mind-blowing experience and I have to say if anybody's ever in London you you've just got to go that is absolutely fabulous. So when you started out and you wrote that first Maggie Hope book, did you envision it as a series or did that somehow come to be later? No, that came to be much, much later. Um, so much later. And I didn't even dare to dream of a series. I barely even dreamed of like being published at all by anyone, even myself. So that it, the, the fact that it's like 10 books in is absolutely insane to me. So how did it come to be a series? Like what was the evolution from one book to like, hey, this is gonna be a series. How did that happen? Well, it's interesting that the editor who finally acquired it um, made a two book offer. And so you, you know how these things work, but basically, so then I was assured like a second book. So I was pretty excited about that. And I just sort of, you know, kind of kept hoping they keep giving me book contracts. And I felt like Scheherazade, like I had to weave my tail so that I would get more book contracts and be able to finish my story and hang out with my characters because I love them. And I wanted them to have like time on so you, stage with people so, so you finished book one and maggie said wait i have more to say like there's more to my story pretty much well i always knew like especially writing mr churchill's secretary like regardless of what happened i knew that you know maggie and her characters would go on as i'm sure you know like they they have these lives right they have their own lives and i knew they'd go on and do different things and do great things and so i sort of had an idea of what maybe they would be doing after the novel ended so but then, you know, I got a chance to actually write it. So that was pretty, pretty amazing. And do you love continuous books in a series? Do you, are there frustrations? How does that feel? Because I know I've only done a couple of sequels and I very much have a love-hate relationship with sequels. So I can't even imagine 10 books in. So tell us about that process of like continuing. You know, I don't really think of them so much as sequels as I think of them as, it's like one huge book. And this is like the, the chapter, the portion that you get for this, this time. So in, in my mind, it's just like a really big book. And yes, I do have sort of an ending on ice waiting for its time. And I do have like a, a definite vision of how I want to wrap things up. Wow. Not that we're doing that anytime in the near You're future. You're breaking my heart. I was like, no. It's like, no, 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 it's okay. Tell me that's like hearing that, that it's the last season of This Is Us coming up. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, it won't be for a while. But I think it's good to work towards a point mm -hmm. so that you're not just endlessly kind of like, you know, so that you have a plot and you have a place to go and you have momentum. I think that adds to the story. Do you have any sense, like, how do you have a lot? I mean, you may not want to tell us many books left in the series, a few, or do you not know? Or are you just going to know when it's the right time? I, I do have a, a certain idea of how many left. I think the last time I went through and actually went through and sort of tried to outline things, my ideal was um, 16 total. So oh, wow. So that's great. Because that means we get another six. Yeah. So that's another awesome. six. Um, you know, it's only 1930, uh, 1943 in the Hollywood Spy. So there's still like plenty of war to go through. 
That's amazing. And the next book I'm doing is a standalone, actually. So now I'm doing what you do. Wait, is it Maggie Hope or something totally different? Totally different. Although it's still, um, it's not quite World War II. It's going to be Los Angeles in the late 30s. Oh. With the rise of Nazis and fascism in the LA area and in the US. So are we going to have to wait longer for Maggie because of this other book? Well, well, yes, but you'll have another book. <laughs> I know, I know. No pressure, no pressure. I love Maggie. But so she's she's there, she's there. And like, if you read The Hollywood Spy, you can see sort of like the, the uh, whisperings of what the next book will be about, which I think is kind of cool. So yeah. well, I won't make you tell us because people have to read the book to find out the whisperings. So, but I would ask in that same vein, and by the way, I hope is everyone is, I'm having a ball because this is my first event since the woman with the blue star came out where I am not being interviewed. I am the interviewer and this is mad fun, but don't let me have all the fun. Put your questions in the Q and A for when we take questions and, and, and we will ask them of Susan. So I know you're not gonna tell us where the next book is going, but tell me, how do you decide where Maggie goes next? Like, how do you decide that after Mr. Churchill's secretary, she's going such and such? Because your books span a wide range of places and topics. And how do you decide? Well, you know, I try to let the characters tell me. And, you know, for Mr. Churchill's secretary, she got that offer to go do MI5 and SOE. And I just thought it would be kind of ridiculous for her to suddenly go and be absolutely successful. I mean, she's a, a bookworm, a blue stocking. There's never been any sort of hint that she was athletic in the least. Um, so for her to go to SOE, you know, training camp and fail out, that felt very real to me, like that someone would just strike out. And I liked the fact that she struck out and then had another chance to sort of develop her skills and develop her craft and work at those physical skills and then come back and be able to do it. Which by the way is super real world because a lot yeah. of women flunked out of SOE, right? It took a lot Absolutely. to get there. And a lot of people had to reapply and a lot of people, you know, um, yeah, just didn't make it. So mm -hmm. I wanted it to be earned. I didn't want to be like, oh, and now she's going and she's going to be like the star of SOE. It's like, no, she's not. She's going to fall in the mud a lot and have to earn her place. And if anyone is new to this, SOE is Special Operations Executive, right? Yeah. So the British. Basically, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, go. Tell us about you SOE. Go, Pam, you go. Well, let's talk about this for a second. I'm going to step off topic for a second. Maybe five years ago, I was contemplating a book idea that involved SOE, the Special Operations Executive. Do you remember me emailing you? And I wrote to you and I said, this is what I'm thinking of. I want to make sure I'm not coming too close to your Maggie Hope books, because to me, like Maggie sort of embodies that whole SOE world. So I just remember asking permission. <laughs> no, and I was so touched because I think you're so amazing and talented. And I knew that whatever you did would be so different from anything I did. Like we're just different people and it's going to come out in a different way. And I loved your book about Paris and the spies in Paris, the, the girls of Paris, right? We lost girls of Paris. Lost girls of Paris. Yes. Um, folks out there. It's so good. Um, yeah. So I loved it. I'm so glad you wrote that. I'm so glad that's in the the era with all the other World War II books. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of recognition of these women who served special operations executives sort of getting their due. And it's really nice, right? Lots of good. I books. have a question for you. When you were selling like World War II books, did you get kickback about the time and the, the, the setting? So I've been doing this. When was your first book out? And then I'll answer you. Do you remember? Uh, 2012. Okay, so my book first book came out in 2007. So I've been doing this so long, I almost consider myself like the grandmother of the genre at this point, right? But I do remember, listen to this, when I was trying to pitch Commandant's Girl, which is my very first book to an agent, right. I came home from work one day, I still remember, and this is when you had physical answering machines, right? It wasn't even like a voicemail, it was an actual answering machine, probably like 2002, 2003. And I got a message from an agent who said, tell me why this book 
is not like all of those other World War II books, right? So I got that pushback initially. Um, and of course, we're always looking at the genre, right? And saying like, has this been done too much? Is it played out? And then there's just more great stories to be told, right? Absolutely. Yeah. But one of the, it's interesting to hear you say that because one of the things that I was hearing was that women were not interested in 20th century historical fiction women were not interested in war fiction and women were only interested in Regency, Victorian and Elizabethan fiction. That was sort of- when they tell us what women are only interested in. Oh, right. I mean, as if (laughs) anyone knows, but it was just so funny. And I really felt like you broke that, you sort of broke down those barriers. And then also uh, Jacqueline Winspear of the Maisie Dobbs books broke down. Yeah, and there were there was definitely some thank you, and there's definitely a lot of women on that early front. So I'm thinking of Jenna Blum, who wrote yeah, those yeah. who save us, and Sarah right. McCoy, and so so a lot of women just kind of knocking at that door. But it's funny. This is totally off topic, but it's funny what they tell us women want to read. So when I first aspired to be an author, and we're going back at least 20, 25 years, it was the height of bridges of madison county okay and i was told by publishing that in order to be saleable your female protagonist had to be between like 45 and 65 years old there was something where that was all they were going to publish and so i remember judy bloom published summer sisters which was like a younger coming of age book and i wrote to her i was like they keep telling me the women have to be older so it's very cyclical right in terms of what's going on it's it's really hard to know like who knows i think actually you know and and thank you to community bookstore but if you would ask somebody who works in a bookstore they would might have a better idea because they're like you know checking people out at the register and ordering in books well and it's funny when i think about the historical fiction i read when i was young and i did read it i don't know but it was all the men right it was leon harris herman luke james michener Um, it was not a the the domain of female writers back then. Not at all. And yeah, and I remember, I, I read all of those, like The Winds of War and- Right, uh, exactly. Darn Jakes. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, I love them. Like, I remember loving the Odessa Files, but I was also sort of aware, like, this is not a girl book. Well, there's just not, the, the story, there, there was something missing perhaps that it was still to be told. There was another story to be told. So I want to get back to Maggie Hope because I love her. Um, and I want to know how has your relationship with Maggie changed over the past almost decade now? Well, you know, it's so interesting when I did first start writing Maggie Hope, she was about, she was 23 and I was 29. So there wasn't that much of an age gap between us. And now she is I don't know, 26 and I am much older than 29. <laughs> and um, so it's like, it's a, it's a longer, it's like, it, I have to remember, like, well, what was I doing at that age? What were my emotions? How was I feeling? Like, how did I feel about boys and marriage and work and, you know, all those kinds of things. Yeah. So it's a little, it's a little bit more, but I'm also kind of used to her and she's, she's become her own character now, of course, and she's her own person. So, you know, she, she kind of does her own thing. I love it. Um, so let's step back you know people have been doing this thing to me in interviews where they ask you like these quick fire questions has anyone done that to uh, you yes yeah. i have a list of them but i'm just going to ask you a couple okay morning writing or evening writing morning writing me too okay oh yeah okay. coffee <laughs> or tea <laughs> coffee in the morning maybe some tea in the afternoon okay excellent bridgerton or mayor of east town oh bridgerton okay Interesting. All right. I like Mayor because she makes my accent sound a little better. Um, <laughs> anyhow, let's get back to the serious questions. So you alluded to this a little bit um, about how you started writing, but can you tell us about your journey to publication? Can you tell the story in case we have any aspiring writers with us? Okay. If there are aspiring writers, you just need to be strong. You just need to be like the last man standing on like in the boxing ring. I feel like that is what it felt like for me. I felt like um, I wrote so many drafts. I was 
rejected so much, so much. I could have papered a whole room with all of my rejections. And they, they a lot of them were paper back then. They weren't emails. Yeah. Um, so, and then, you know, it just happened again and again and again, like at each stage of publishing. And it was long, it was arduous, it was discouraging. And the one person I have to thank is my agent, uh, Victoria Skernick with Levine Greenberg who was like this fairy godmother figure to me and to Maggie Hope. And I remember I, I was just, I was really at the end of my ability to cope with getting rejection letter after rejection letter. And I said to her, you know, I know I signed a contract with you guys, but I really think, you know, I wanna publish myself and maybe give it away for a holiday gift. And she said, well, you know, that's fine, but maybe, you know, let me try just like a few more people. And that's when um, Bantam came came in with a two book deal. But I really felt like like I was at the end of my rope. And that was after like more than a decade of writing, revising, getting an agent, getting a new agent, just so much rejection. It's incredible, right? Those people who stick with us. Yes. And you need like my husband, I have to say too, he's over, he's um, he was so supportive. Like, I just, I don't think I could have done it like without him and without right. Victoria, really. Right. Can I say, since your husband's there, that I'm a mad fan of like, I admire what he does as a puppeteer. And the reason I'm saying this is if you do not follow Susan on social media, you should, because she not only posts amazing things about her books, but sometimes cool tidbits about her husband's work. So kudos to both of you. Follow oh, Susan thank you. And you know what, he's an amazing editor because he works in television and he, he's written a lot for television, and even though it's puppets and it's, um, he has a really good sense of timing. So I'm so happy, like he's always my first editor. He's always the first pair of eyes to see anything. When I talk to a screenwriter on the rare occasion, it's like a masterclass in storytelling. I'm, I don't right. know, did you ever Save the Cat? Yes, yes. I just read Save the Cat, yes. So for anyone who's listening who doesn't know, Save the Cat is a book about screenwriting, but the system in Save the Cat totally helps novelists with their structure. You can use it as a novelist, absolutely. Yeah, right. So tell me, speaking of nice segue into, tell us about your writing process. Well, you know, as, as, as you know, there's a ton of research that you need to do. Um, I love doing research. I love doing research online. I love doing research in libraries. I love doing research, you know, watching documentaries. I love interviewing people, which was actually a little easier when I first started because there were more sure. true survivors then than there are now. Although I still have a friend going along fine at 85. Um, so I love immersing myself in research and I love looking at things like clothes and perfume and what was popular on the radio and all of those wonderful, cool things that make, make a novel to me, at least seem real, you know, this makes, make a life seem real. Do you research ahead of time or as you go? I used to research ahead of time now it's sort of a combination because i really feel if i've just researched i could spend like two years researching and i'd never write anything so i allow myself a certain amount of research and then um then start writing and then if i need to look anything up i'll i'll do that okay yeah you know it's funny i was once on a panel with two writers who write contemporary fiction and one of them said yeah just kind of turn on the computer and start going and i did this like, yeah. what this double take because it's a whole other job for us right exactly and, and like i don't know how much do you put in like how what's your process well for for research i'm a contemporary contemporaneous researcher so i only need a bit before i start and then i research as i go on kind of a need to know basis and this is very That's efficient hard. for two reasons one is that um my research brain and my writing brain kind of work at different times of the day so if i'm too tired to write in the afternoon i can research but also because research can serve as writing prompts so when i'm researching i'm taking down notes and then that can give me something to work on so that's kind of how i do it i think that's so smart and honestly if i have to be absolutely honest i do think i research as a bit of a procrastination tool just because it's so fun to research and it's so hard to write so, but, anyway, but I'm getting better with that um so 
it was speaking of research you took at least one cool trip to la for this book right i did i did it Tell was us about that amazing um well i um i went solo but then my husband and son met up with me and i stayed initially at the chateau marmont which was insanely cool and also pretentious and weird but the history was fantastic um and then we stayed at the biltmore for a while and i just had so much like so much of la is gone right it's a city where so much has been bulldozed over and so the ambassador hotel is gone and the brown derby's gone and a lot of the places that i wanted to see were gone but i did go and see where they had been and then there are things that still exist so one of the things my husband and son loved most was going out to eat mm. and there were a lot of restaurants that are still around that were around back then like Cantor's Deli they loved Cantor's um, they loved Coles which has like the French dip sandwiches they loved the Tama Shanter which is like a Scottish pub by way of Los Angeles so I figured like as long as I feed them well, nice. they'll drive me around and put up with my notes and stuff. This is good to know. I've never taken my family on the research trip, but uh -huh. I think now I'm in for it. I don't think I can avoid it any longer. This is the first time because I think before my son's just been too young and he had no interest, honestly. Um, but food, if you bribe them. Okay, this is good to know. I'm taking notes. Yeah absolutely food and also like we did a lot of fun things like the disney studios and we did the warner brothers studios and we went to like an airport museum okay well they weren't that into the airport museum right. but the disney studios they really liked well these insider tours because of muppeteering or is this like anybody can do this the warner brothers tour was for everybody the disney i have to say was thanks to like all right we won't hold that against you a little magic yes so I'm curious, um, this past year has been really challenging and I'd love to hear kind of how COVID and this whole thing we've all been through has affected you kind of as a writer. I just remember it, when all of this happened, I meant, I was like, I'm not gonna stop writing. I'm just gonna like, just go through this and I'm, I'm gonna be, you know, what was going around online? Like, oh, Shakespeare wrote King Lear during a plague. So like, why can't you so suck it up people? Yeah, right. so suck it up, do your novel. Um, but I do remember like, especially in April and remember we, we lived in New York and things were bad. You know, there were just sirens 24 seven and it, it was really bad. And I just remembered like, I would have my computer open on my lap but I would basically just be watching like CNN. And then like, there was the Cuomo, the Mario Cuomo, our governor um, would do a press conference at 11. Right. And then there would be like the clapping for the essential workers at seven. And those were like the two points of my day that I remember like, I might've gotten up and shut off my computer. Right. You know what I mean? But it's like, but nothing was actually getting done. And then Pam, I, I know as an author, you will cringe when you hear this, but at one point, mm -hmm. And I, I think this was like later in April, I spilled coffee on my computer. Yes. And I thought, I'm not really technologically savvy, but I thought I'd been saving to the cloud. And yes, certain things saved, but a lot didn't save. So I went to bed for about two weeks, you know, like a Victorian maiden, because I was just... It was just all too much, but my lovely editor sent me a bottle of gin. Um, <laughs> I was saying I drank the whole bottle of gin, but it was a lovely, lovely gesture. And um, well, life just kind of went on. Excellent, I hear you. I hear so if you're, if you're a writer, save to the cloud, but also look, look and make sure you're saving. Really good. Yes, I hear you. It was a crazy year. It absolutely was. And how did you, how did you cope? Like how? Well, my start to the pandemic was very odd. So I will share this anecdote that I was supposed to go on a research trip to Krakow for the woman with the blue star. And I don't often get to go on research trips, but this one I was going and I booked this nice, like mom only trip, like really nice first class, good hotels. I was going back because I used to live in Poland and I hadn't been there in right. years. So I was going to go. I booked my ticket for March 11th, 2020. 
And as everything started to happen with the pandemic, my editor said, oh, we don't know if you should go to Poland. I said, I'm going and I'm going to wear, what are one of those mask things? Like, I'm going to wear a mask because we didn't know what masks were. My flight got canceled. Thank goodness it did. Because the next day on March 12th, I had an emergency appendectomy. And if I had gone on that plane, I would have been over Europe. Um, But I came home from the hospital the next day and the entire world had shut down. My kids' school, we like never left the house again. And so it was very Rip Van Winkle, um, the start to the pandemic. It was very odd. Wow, that is awesome. So so all good now. We're all good. We are all healthy and we work from home and it's all good. But yes. So on a lighter note, tell us what you like to read. Like, do you what do you read everything? Do you have time to read? Where do you read? Like, what you, what do you like as a reader? I I would say I do my reading for work during the day, usually in the afternoons after like I can't write anymore and I'm just like mm-hmm. losing it. Um, but my favorite time to actually read for pleasure is after dinner, and I will take a book and go to the bedroom and shut the door Ooh. so I have some. You know, you get that. to shut the door. Wait a minute. Back this yeah. up. You can't, you can't <laughs> shut your door. Well, no, you no, know, I, I just thought, I didn't know I could do this. Like mom's gone to read. This is awesome. I read in the pickup line at school. This is a revelation. Well, I do that too. Like, well, back in, in the before times, like I would read on the subway and, you know, all these different places, but um, yeah, but my cat insists on being with me, but okay. that's kind of nice. nice. That's awesome. So what have you read lately that you've liked? What are you reading? I've been reading. Oh, no, this was not a plant, except for that, except for that. Um, no, um, I actually, um, Jeff Abbott has uh, a book out today. Actually, this is like an amazing day for books coming out. I, yeah. I just read his, um, The Widows, and now I'm blanking on what The Widows are doing. The Widows. Um, I just read Lori Raider Day's newest, which isn't out yet, but it's amazing. Um, I just try to keep, you know, I'm really trying to keep up with my friends. And yeah. like my friends, like my friends are great writers. It's insane. Awesome. Yes, I um, agree. I read the latest Mariah um, Frederick's Jane Prescott novel. I don't know if you read those, but I love Jane. That's great. That was delightful. Wonderful, excellent. So we've amassed some questions in the queue and I'm gonna to turn to those and some of them we might have touched upon since the questions were posted. So I'm gonna read them and we'll see if we've read them. So this first question says, hi, Susan, do you have the Maggie Hope series ending already mapped out? I personally would like it to go on forever. I am with you. This is from Mary and Mary, I am with you. So you said you know something of the end, but do you have it mapped out? I don't know if mapped out is the right word, but I do have like a story in mind that I want to tell. And I have, I like know what characters I want involved and I know what it, what I want it to accomplish. And then I do have uh, like an ending scene. Excellent. So, Excellent. Yeah. so Alana asks, will we see more of Maggie's mother in the books to come? You dangled another encounter with her in the King's Justice. And I want to know this while you're talking about this, Talk a little bit about Maggie's mother and Maggie's relationship with her, as well as will we see her again? Oh, my. Well, first of all, yes. And I think that's Alana, my editor. So hi, Alana. Um, Yes, you will see lots more of Maggie's mother. And she will she will play a big role in the end game of the novel. Like, that's what we're kind of working on. (laughs) <laughs> no, 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 no. But like, like later, later, much later. Um, but no, I like she's an important character. And it's just I, I don't want to. I don't. It's not like I don't want to waste her. But I feel like it's going to be so big and so powerful that I really want to save it for the finale. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Jennifer asks, what's it like writing a recurring character who fans feel like they have ownership over expectations of? Do you feel pressure as a writer to maintain a certain version of Maggie Hope? Do you receive reader feedback about your choices regarding her development? You know, I feel like mostly readers are along for the ride. And with The King's Justice, that was the book before this, Maggie took a kind of dark turn. Um, and I was actually pretty scared about that. I didn't know if people would stick around for the ride. I, I, I didn't know. And I was a little concerned, but Maggie as a character had just been through so much. And I just thought it would be disingenuous to not let her have a little bit of PTSD and a bit of a breakdown because 
she's not a superhero, you know, she's a regular human being. So readers actually responded well to that. Um, and I was pleased and surprised. And I think now with the Hollywood spy, Maggie going to Los Angeles and getting to like go to dances and restaurants and flirting with men. Like, I feel like she's really earned it. I agree. I love dark Maggie. Let's call her hot mess Maggie. Can we call her that? <laughs> I like that. I really that I re really remember that moment. And you know, um, it's very it's very powerful. A lot of people identify with that. I think. Yeah. So it was less of a of a thing than I thought it was going to be. But you know, I'm going to jump in before I ask the rest of the questions, and please keep them coming. And I want to know about Maggie's circle of friends, right? She has a very rich circle of friends, especially when she's in London, but not exclusively. And so I want to know for people who have not read the new book, are we bringing the circle of friends or some of the friends, or is this like a whole new group of friends going on in LA? Well, some of the, the circle of friends are in LA. Like, so John Sterling, her former fiance, has been working in Los Angeles for Walt Disney. He's been doing uh, propaganda oh. for the war. Um, and he also might have a, a few other irons in the fire. So we'll see John Sterling again. And then Sarah uh, Sanderson, who is one of Maggie's roommates and a ballet dancer. Um, she's been in so many of the books and she gets to go to LA to dance in a movie, which is based on the Hollywood canteen. I'm calling the fictional one, the Star Spangled Canteen, but she's she is a leading dance role. So that's another reason Maggie goes to Los Angeles is to hang out with Sarah. And, and you, know. you know, I want to ask you, though, how was writing Los Angeles different than writing Maggie in Europe? Was the experience different? It was so different. It was like if you were an artist and you were used to using, you know, grays and browns and dark blues and purples, and suddenly you're giving, you're given this palette with like hot pink and emerald green and all these insane bright colors. Um, the thing is though, that underneath those bright colors, there's a lot of shadow. So, that's awesome. you know, that's part of it too. But her initial impression, part, part of the initial thing that I was writing was just this like technicolor world and, I remember I really was inspired by the movie, The Wizard of Oz and how it went from black and white to technical. <clears throat> I felt like England in that point was a, a black and white space almost. And like to go into that color was fun, really fun. Which I think is a fabulous analogy, but I wanna say, and I don't know where else I would work this in, Susan, one of the things you do so well is showing the nuances in black and white England, um, uh, you know, and Europe in general, what the difference between what 1941 looks like and 1943 looks like, and those little nuances in life come across with such authenticity in your writing. Well, you know, a few months in the war meant sea changes. I mean, huge changes in terms of, you know, the politics and what was going on in the news, but also what was being rationed, if your house was still standing, um, you know, if your lover was alive or dead. Um, so three months is, is, you know, a year or more in regular time. I agree. So there's a couple questions here that I think we may have answered already. One was about the invention of Maggie Hope, which we talked about when you went to the war rooms. Um, and then, Another question was a tiny hint about what your upcoming standalone is about. So do you want to tell us a bit more of that? Sure. Uh, well, the standalone was inspired by the research I did for The Hollywood Spy. And specifically, I read a book called Hitler in Los Angeles, and it's by a man named Stephen R. Ross. He is brilliant, and he wrote this nonfiction book about the rise of Nazism and fascism in Los Angeles in the 30s, um, something I didn't know anything about. And it's a wonderful book. It reads like a thriller. And so I knew I wanted to use that for The Hollywood Spy. And then the more I read it, because I went back and I reread it a few times, some of the, the tiny little characters, the background characters, I realized were fascinating. And I wanted to know more about them. And then I thought, they were really worthy of their own story. And I, I wanted to, so I wanted to write about um, American women, like American women in the US and 
there will be two protagonists and they're going to be a mother and a daughter. So I'll have a chance to keep writing a 20 something, but also write a 50 something. Which is nice. That doesn't, we don't always get to do that, right? We don't always get to do that. And I'm sort of, you know, and a mom and, you know, so I'm, yeah. I'm kind of excited about that. That's awesome. So someone asked, will Maggie return to the U.S. or visit her aunt in Boston at some point? I, you know, she visits. So before she gets to L.A., she actually stops over in Boston and she visits with her Aunt Edith. And that, that's not actually in the book, but it's, you know, I, I allude to it in the book. So she sees, she's seen Edith and Edith actually pops up in The Hollywood Spy. Um, I'm not sure if she'll really get back to the US. It's really dangerous to cross the ocean, you know, during the war and- There's so much left to do in Europe. She has there's so, much so much left to do in Europe. Um, I always do think though that like Edith has her own, like obviously she has her own like little world. And I, I picture her and her partner, Olive, like solving all these mysteries in their like little village of Wellesley, Massachusetts. And, but they, but she doesn't tell Maggie what she does. And Maggie's of course not telling her what she does. So, but they're both kind of doing their own detective thing. Love that. So Alex says they are so wonderfully different, but wouldn't it be fun if Maggie Hope and Maisie Dobbs could have a brief meetup at some point? That would be fun. I, that would be really- I agree if Jacqueline would agree, right? <laughs> Actually, there's this wonderful woman on, Facebook and she in the pandemic just to kind of keep herself sane she um she makes dolls and she makes you know pillows and all kinds of crafts and she did a Maggie Hope doll and a Maisie Dobbs doll Aww. and she had a picture of them like holding hands Aww. and it was so cute That's like awesome. it was beautiful so amazing. yes so uh, there's just one more question here unless anyone wants to add one in and the question is any news on film or tv rights that were optioned Ah, okay. So, and you've probably gone through all this kind yes, of stuff. Yes, yes. It's all a house of cards. It's very, very crazy, strange business. Um, the Maggie Hope story has been optioned, I like four different times. Um, so it was optioned out of the blue by Warner Brothers Pictures right before the pandemic. Um, really nothing happened before the pandemic. And I do think that things might be starting to get pitched about now. Yeah. So fingers crossed. Um, I, from your mouth to God's ears. Exactly. Um, I would love to see it. It's just like, I have no power over this. I have no control. So it's I just, go away and forget about it until yeah, I realize, you've right? got to, you've got to just leave it up to yeah. prominence and so so that is the end of our question susan do you have anything you'd like to tell us that i have not asked you or that you have not been asked well i'd like to ask you some questions pam uh oh okay go ahead okay so what makes you choose to do like a current present day wrap around to your historical fiction because i'm intrigued by that i'm fascinated by writers who do that you do it so beautifully Thank you. So I have not done it in all of my books. So yeah, for true. example, The Lost Girls of Paris purely stayed in history, but The Woman with the Blue Star and The Orphan's Tale both had what I would call bookends. So it right. was um, present day prologue, present day epilogue, and the book is in historical. So a couple things. I do love modern and I don't get to write modern. I don't even sometimes have the option. Like, like my books where they want it is kind of truly historical. So I don't generally, with one exception, get to do those books that go back and forth between past and present. Those, those don't work out for me. Um, so this is a little bit of a way to get the present. It's a little bit of a way to see the mystery right yeah. and maybe draw the reader in i think is why some projects call for it and some do not and i'm trying to think in my present project does not does not have it the next one so about 50 50. i just think it's so interesting and i've never done it but i'm dying to try it i've done it maybe for four i could estimate about four times out of 11 four to five times out of 11 books yeah and i Really, the woman with the blue star, you're changing perspectives. Yes. Two. So you've got two girls, right? Well, I will tell you an honest story about this book. I okay. wrote this book and I turned it into my editor. And after 11 books, my editor said, no, 
And I was like, no. And she's like, no. And I had to rewrite 95% of the woman with the blue star in five months, which I, it's kind of like that moment where you curled up in bed, all Victorian style. That was yeah. what I felt because um, all of that work was for naught. Um, but one of the major changes in the rewrite was the two perspectives. So when I first wrote the woman with the blue star, I only wrote it from the perspective of the, the Jewish girl who's hiding in the sewer from the Nazis. Right. Um, and then I expanded the book to have the point of view of Ella who's up on the street and they meet one another. But that was a product of revision, actually. That was not in the original. That's amazing. It's it's incredible what editor suggestions can do. And in the moment, it feels heartbreaking and like, you know, it's demoralizing because there's so much work to be but done. But they're always right, aren't they? They're always right. They're they're always right. Always, it's crazy. They're always right. I feel like I, I think my, yes. agent, my editor are here. And yes. You were right. You were right. You're right. Mine aren't here, but in case they watch, you're right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So um it, should we wrap up there do you think or is there anything else you'd like to tell us about the book oh gosh i think it would be a great summer read in fact they even go to the beach maggie and john even go to the beach at santa monica Ooh. So there's beaches there's palm trees there's cocktails okay there's the occasional nazi and the kkk but there's also a lot of fun i do think it would be a really good summer summer reading. intrigue at its finest i yeah. agree you must read this book i want everyone to go immediately to community bookstore either in person or online and i want you to order the hollywood spy if you have not done so already now can they get if people order from community bookstore can they get autographed copies they can get autographed copies. Amazing. So where should people find you online as well? Oh, so uh, SusanEliaMcNeil.com. And I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram under my name. And Community Bookstore is just the best. I have to give a shout out because it is our neighborhood bookstore. We love it. I basically feel like I raised my son there. Um, all of his books basically came from Community Bookstore. So yay. That's awesome. When I come to visit, you're taking me there, okay? Absolutely. I'll show you the turtles. Awesome. Incredible. Um, I can confirm the turtles are still there in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I, um, I don't know how they're faring right now, but um, it would be absolutely wonderful to have you both there. And thank you so much for tonight. This was such a wonderful event. And I want to thank our audience for all the questions as well. Um, the series is so well loved and it's been really great to hear you talk about how you've crafted it and taken it to this point. Um, so thank you so much, Sam, uh, Su Susan and Pam, sorry, my, my no, okay. consonants Actually, mixed that's up. That's a good question. <laughs> I, I, thank you for having us and happy launch day, Susan. Oh, happy launch you. day. And thank you for having me and yay community books. And thank you everybody for coming <laughs> out on a Tuesday night and sitting in front of your computer. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, I'll bid you all a good night. Okay. Um, good night, everyone.